Hello and welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Andrea Pearson. And I'm Joe Lalo. For, today, for today's show, it's just the three of us, and we're going to talk about a little bit about things you can try if you've published a few books or more than a few books, but you're still kind of in the hole. You haven't been able to get to the point where the books are paying for themselves. And before we get to that, kind of that'll be the second half of the show, we're also going to take a look at some of uh, Mark Coker from Smashwords. Every year he puts out a big uh, publishing predictions for the upcoming year, and his article for this year is 2021 Publishing Predictions Pandemic Reshapes Publishing Accelerates Consolidation that he published on his blog, and he's got a bunch of predictions, and we thought it might be interesting to discuss them a little bit. We are we don't always agree with Mark, but I, I at least always appreciate that he brings this, these things up and, and makes us think about it, so we will we'll make you guys think about it, too, if you're going to listen. If not, you can skip to the second half of the show. Um, before we jump into that Stuff. Uh, do you guys have any news that you want to share? Yeah, uh, it's it's funny because I'm like, we, we he brings these points up just for me to disagree with him. I swear, that's <laughs> I'm like, I don't agree with that, Mark. I don't agree with that, Mark. But some of his points were actually really good, and I'm I'm looking forward to getting into those ones. Um, okay, so um, I just yeah, something that I've noticed, and this is just a little bit of, of a tip that I've been thinking about, but something I've noticed over the last several years of being an author is that authors a lot of the time will retweet articles and images and links, et cetera, without adding a comment in them. And the reason I'm talking about this is, is because the best way to make an impression on someone is to add your own thoughts to something. So why did you feel the need to retweet? How can it help your followers? Um, and um, how is it going to help people want to actually open the link or whatever? Um, so, and the same thing is, is applicable for Facebook. Don't just share something, add a bit of instruction or personality to it before posting. Uh, because helping people remember you goes a long way toward getting downloads or followers who want to help you out, especially if you've been retweeting or sharing their stuff. Um, and then also remember that social media should be about you giving and not about asking. And I, I'm going to bet most of, our, most of our listeners already know this. You don't just hop on and say, buy my book, right? Um, or follow me or, you know, anything that's you asking them to do something. Um, if you're going to be spending time there, which, you know, depending on your business model, you should be, or if your business model is like mine, you shouldn't be <laughs> what you share should add value to people's lives. And so for me, I don't get on very often. So when I do share, it's going to be something that I think people who follow me will appreciate. I don't remember the last time I sent a tweet out was <laughs> was a long time ago, but on F Facebook, my readers like hearing about my kids and I've stopped emailing about my kids. And so I've, um, um, when I post on Facebook, people pay attention. And just as a side note, uh, I haven't emailed since the beginning of October. It's actually been three months. No, wait, math, two months tonight since I emailed last. And Lindsay, I had my first experience of drama on Facebook. My readers were like, where's Andrea? And then somebody said, she's doing this. And then somebody took offense at how that person said it. And there were like 30 comments on that one person's comment before my mom sent me a message saying, Hey, are you paying attention to this? You need to go stop it. And I was like, Oh, it was bad. I was like, guys, calm down. <laughs> Seriously. Some people are like, Oh, Andrea's doing this and this. And somebody else was like, I don't care what you think. I want to hear from Andrea anyway. Sorry. So that was exciting. We'll see how it shakes out. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like, and it turned into this thing, like you were Jack Ma and they were speculating if you were ever going to be found again, or if the Chinese government had made you disappear, but your story is better. That's more interesting or uh, less scary anyway. Sorry, Joe, let me let you go for your news next. It's all right. I, my news is relatively uneventful. I, uh, I took my NaNoWriMo book out of, you know, it, it was sitting there waiting for a revision for a while because I had done some pretty deep beta reading feedback back and forth. So this week was largely uh, dedicated to finishing that up. And as tends to be the case, um, I thought it was going to take me one day and it's going to take me four because I ended up adding an entirely new chapter. And not, in addition to the two scenes I knew I was going to write and the epilogue I knew I was going to write. So the good news is it went from being around 80,000 words. So it's probably going to end up being around 100,000 words, which I prefer to put out a book around that length. That's about the, the median length for, for, for my books. And uh, but the bad news is I went out and bought a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream that I said that I was going to eat once I finished this book. And it's still waiting for me. So and it's not I'm not going to be eating it tonight either. So that's where I am. 
Well, that'd be good if you're also trying to like if dieting was one of your New Year's <laughs> resolutions and you don't get it till like March. Now, now let's yeah. hope you get it tomorrow then. Um, I, I did want to agree too with Andrea's comment about the retweeting. I, I mean, I occasionally retweet and throw them out there, but like when I'm looking for looking up an author like that spoke to me or something, and I all I see is retweets. I like that doesn't tell me anything about you. Um, it's really better to be a content provider rather than just part of the echo chamber. And like Andrea said, now you have the option to add your own comments to a retweet, but you could also just click the article, read it and post it yourself. And you can always go like, you can give credit to the person who did it, but uh, that may be a little more interesting rather than just echoing what somebody else said. So that's a thought. For those that actually care about Twitter and engage there, I, I know that's not everybody. All right, let's jump into our topic guys, or our first topic, our pre-topic, that's what we'll call it. So this is from Mark's article. This is, um, before he gets into the actual predictions, I'm gonna read this, this is just, this is a long article. And like I said, there's a link to it in the show notes or just go to blog.smashwords.com. All right, he says, COVID-19 <clears throat> COVID was a black swan event that continues to have enormous impact on authors, readers, and retailers. It created new winners and losers, and it accelerated the progression of several entrenched trends in publishing while pausing or redirecting other trends. For most indie authors, 2020 was an up year for ebook sales after several years of decline. I find it difficult to celebrate this achievement when we consider the cost. 2020 started weak for indie authors, with most ebook retailers experiencing year over year sales declines for the first two months of the year. This marked a continuation of a multi year trend of lackluster ebook sales exacerbated by rampant devaluation pressures in a slow growth industry. Um, my thoughts on this no disagreement on the big on the first part of this. Uh, it was a very strange year and traditional publishing, we talked about last time, uh, a lot of struggles kind of having to pivot to completely online stuff. Um, it, actually, his comment that sales had been declining earlier in the year and in previous years was kind of news to me. So it's interesting, as in I hadn't known this, but I, I don't think he actually cited sources. So I'm not sure if these are like industry wide numbers, uh, you know, and if this was true of all retailers or if it was true of Smashwords specifically as a, distri as a distributor. And if it was the, the latter, I kind of might chalk it up to people switching platforms to draft to digital and some of the other options. I, I feel like Smashwords hasn't done a whole lot to evolve over the years. And if you go, I mean, they've certainly done some updates, but the storefront and everything is really, the dashboard is everything is still pretty similar as to when I made an account in 2010. And honestly, it kind of looked like a late 1990s site, even in 2010. Sorry, Mark, <laughs> I'm sure you don't listen to our show, but uh, so I, I don't know if that's industry-wide or if it's just the Smashwords is seeing kind of a, a decline in sales. Like I know I don't make as much there because I now, put more stuff direct and I, I've started putting some stuff on draft to digital for the other places. Do you guys have thoughts on that? Um, I, I would say that like uh, regarding the sales trends, my sales were slightly up this year compared to the previous one, but it wasn't a drastic enough change for me to, to, to suspect that it was uh, an industry change. I think it probably had much more, I would have, I would have probably would have had a much better year overall if I'd kept my head in the promo game, as I discussed uh, in, in other episodes it was sort of a, an issue for me this year. But I'd say there's also good evidence to support that the overall strength of the ebook market was pretty good this year. And I, similarly, I'm not 100% sure about the decline in prior years. Again, I tend to keep an eye on my stuff and not so much the entire market. Um, and my stuff, it, it performed, you know, in accordance with the amount of releases I had and the amount of promotion I did. So I would say it was fairly steady for me uh, and, again, improved slightly this year. Um, and I, I think that, I mean, I know that Mark pays a lot of attention to things outside of his company, out of, outside of Smashwords, um, but still his experience is with Smashwords. It's his company and he's biased towards it. And while most genres did fairly well this year, romance took a huge dip when COVID hit. Um, and I think that the reason Mark didn't notice that or take note of that was because the ma vast majority of romance authors are on KU and Mark wouldn't have a lot of data on that unless he actively sought it out. Um, and so I would guess that he's probably just going by Smashwords numbers. Um, but I've been reading a ton in, of Alex Newton's genre reports lately, and he showed the huge nosedive that romance authors saw. So, I mean, for those who are listening and who had a nosedive around that time, and especially if you wrote romance, um, if, you, if your sales went down, don't let news that the industry in whole did better this year discourage you. 
Um, anyway, so I do know a lot of authors who had a really good year. My royalties did pretty decently considering my last release was in April and I've, you know, neglected. I've just like abandoned my newsletter list. Those, those poor readers, they're probably, probably so sad. So sad. Actually, I have been getting about an email a day saying, where are you? <laughs> anyway, I'm like, well, I'm kind of throwing a temper tantrum right now, but you know, <laughs> I just burned out on everything. Anyway, so those are my thoughts. Um, very rambly. Sorry, rabbit hole. All right, well, we'll move on to the next uh, little few paragraphs I grabbed from the article. Uh, he says, although indie authors benefited this year from COVID-19 in the form of stronger ebook sales, except those noted by Andrea <laughs> five seconds ago, um, the pandemic also altered the power structure of the publishing industry in ways that will amplify future inequalities and jeopardize author independence. Physical bookstores were big losers in the pandemic, while enormous power consolidated around a small number of major online platforms such as Facebook, Amazon, and Google. These dominant platforms wield their supreme power to stand between you and your audience. We've traded one group of authoritarian overlords for another. These platforms are the new gatekeepers for indie authors. But rather than gatekeeping an author's books based on editorial quality, author reputation, sales potential, or relevance to the reader, they gatekeep based on the author's willingness and ability to pay for access to those readers. The payment comes in the form of paid advertising. And in the particular case of Amazon, pressure to accept additional concessions such as reduced royalties, control, and distribution. I feel like I run out of breath. I got to work on this. I just did an interview with my narrator and she's great. She knows how to breathe and like talk at the same time. I'm super impressed. Um, so my comments on this is that uh, you know, it's definitely worth keeping all this in mind and being aware of it, right? There's there's a reason why governments around the world keep talking about breaking these guys up. Uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, all these guys have a ton of power, and there are relatively few places for us to advertise effectively. And, and all that advertising we do does cut into our bottom line, and we're going to talk more about that in, in some of his predictions below. But right now, Amazon is the only one requiring exclusivity, as far as I know, or punishing you in a way, a manner of speaking, if you don't sign up for it. Basically, by lower, lower royalties on Audible ACX, if you don't sign up for the exclusive option. Also, lower, lower royalties in KDP in some of the international stores on Amazon, if you aren't in KDP Select. I've been surprised over the years that they haven't actually rolled out more of that and dropped more people to 35 cents or more stores or 35%. Uh, not to give them any ideas or anything, because uh, they could always change that and punish you more, basically, if you're not exclusive. Um, but And of course, you get less visibility on Amazon if you're not getting the Kindle Unlimited borrows, potentially, if you, if you would have had visibility otherwise. I mean, you still have to be selling X amount to kind of get in any of the charts and, and show up in all subots and stuff like that. But this is all a good reminder that, you know, we talk a lot about building a newsletter and having your own site so that if you ever have to decide to walk away from these big platforms or you feel forced to, you can still contact your fans and let them know other ways to support you. Like maybe you would decide to shift more of your efforts to Patreon or to doing direct sales from your website. That's only an option if you can email your people and let them know, hey, not I'm not selling as much here anymore or I'm not going to play the game on this particular site so this is where you can buy my books and you can get them for less here because I make more if you buy them from me so uh, you know always keeping in in there that there has to be a motivation for them to want to like buy direct all right I will pass it to Joe for his thoughts um, one of the things that stuck out to me about the stranglehold that some advertisers have is the repeated struggles that David Gogren had with Facebook like I don't know if you follow David Gogren, but you, chances are if you listen to us, you probably do. Um, he, he's, you know, he's an educator when it comes to book promotion. So not only does he probably spend an awful lot of money on Facebook doing advertising, not just to sell books, but to also educate himself on how to effectively spend money on, on Facebook, he's going to be teaching people how to effectively spend money on Facebook. So he is, one would imagine, a very important customer uh, relatively speaking in the author world about uh, uh, for, to Facebook and yet Facebook repeatedly uh, banned him. They could repeatedly mess with his account without any particular reason. They kept on turning it back on and then it kept on getting banned again. So like, even though Facebook makes money from him on multiple levels, you'd think his level of service, you know, this level of service should have been a black eye to any other organization, except that you can't really walk away from Facebook because again, there's not so many people in that room that you can you can like put your advertising dollar to. 
So uh, the better we get at, at, at doing advertising that's not pay per click promotion, uh, the better we'll be a little overall, I think, because it'll take a it'll make it a little bit more likely that places like Facebook will have to actually provide a degree of customer service uh, in order to keep you as a customer. So here's hoping over time we learn to spread ourselves out, if only to make the other platforms raise the tide to raise all boats, basically. So luckily for authors, um, even though we've traded one set of overlords for another, in this case, us being able to reach readers doesn't depend on a bunch of people we've never met, finding our books in a slush pile, liking those books, then deciding to sign it on and send it to a bunch of other people who have slush piles and waiting for them to like it, waiting for them to decide. So because of that, we can write, revise, edit, and release a book in a fraction of the time, so months instead of years. Um, a couple of my clients love that old system. That's where they're most comfortable. And it's really, really hard for them to gain traction, at least mentally in the indie author world. Uh, but the new one, um, this new world has a st still has a nice element of freedom that the previous one didn't. Most authors have to spend marketing dollars to reach readers. But if we're diligent and learn the system, it's absolutely possible to do um, without needing somebody's permission. And I'm all about that. I'm kind of you know, rebellious or whatever. Um, and there isn't a company on earth that doesn't need to do marketing of some sort to get the word out, even if word of mouth is still, I mean, even word of mouth is still advertising. So you, you have to start somewhere. Um, we have a much greater chance of success with the current model than we did with the old. Um, but that said, I do, I agree with Mark. Something is going to give somewhere. These companies can't last forever. None do. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens and where the chips fall. And then again, as Lindsay said, make sure you have your interests taken care of. Have a newsletter list, keep the rights to your books, learn the ins and outs of the business and all of that, including marketing. All right, we will move on to the first of the predictions. And he had 12 or 13. I think we've picked four or five to talk about here. This is the only one that is political <laughs> and we're going to try like we're not going to we're going to try not to take sides or anything here. Just be really neutral reporting this. So whatever you think, uh, just stick with us. This is the only one that uh, mentions presidents. Um, but his prediction is that there there was a Trump effect that will a Trump effect will lead to more book reading in 2021. Uh, he says, regardless of how you feel about Donald Trump, most people would agree that he held a sizable portion of our daily media consumption attention. With each day, his presidency served a tantalizing new episode of must see reality TV. What are we going to do with our extra hours of free time each week? A portion of that time will shift to reading. Yay for books. Um, so my thoughts on this, I was a little skeptical about this one. I doubt people are going to read more under Biden than they did under Trump. I had a lot of people email me this year and uh, thank me for my books because they needed an escape from the politics and the pandemic. So I, I feel like COVID definitely had a, a big effect on more reading time, people being stuck inside. But um, I, I don't know about who, who's the president and if that's really going to affect things. And especially uh, outside of the US, right? I don't know how many people in other countries, like I know we're the drama and we we here in the u.s are on the news in a lot of countries but i don't know how many of uh, you guys outside of the u.s were particularly riveted by our, our president's tweets and and stuff like that and the u.s is only one ebook market so yeah I, I think that um we've got probably six six nine more months of people being kind of shut in and, and not out as much and then when vaccines are out to most of the western countries people will be back to having more construction or construction well that's possible too more distractions so um hey if there's more reading this year i'll be delighted but i wouldn't necessarily count on it uh i don't really have any evidence to support this statement it's just speculation and supposition but uh i don't think that i, I think there's a few things that are ke keeping this this uh prediction from being true like first off uh, trump is not going to vanish from earth like he's you know he was in the news and 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 just just generally known since you know forever. I've always known about Trump in my entire life. So, you know, he'll continue to be distracting. He'll just be distracting from a different, you know, chair. He won't have launch codes wherever he is. Um, second, like, I would hope that the last four years have trained people to keep an eye on uh, politics a little closer. So the people who, who have sort of gotten used to getting politics drama will just be looking for the next piece of politics drama. And there's always going to be plenty to go around. We've also learned there's not so many adults in the room when it comes to the higher positions of power. So maybe more of us are going to be keeping an eye on everybody involved just to make sure they're, they're on the up and up. And there's the fact that, you know, a lot of people like he was 
it's a little bit of shock jock effect where where uh, people half of the people were were listening to what Trump was saying because they agreed and half because they disagreed but everybody wanted to hear what he said and if you'd swap the person in power it's just going to swap which ones are listening for for which reason so i think that we're going to see a lot of the same stuff uh and you know there's also the simple fact that old habits die hard like if there are people who who have now been trained to get a drama fix off of social media from whatever the heck's going on they'll find that drama fix no matter where they look so i i think that we're not going to see a huge shift toward books just because a less polarizing figure is in the white house yeah i agree <laughs> um i mean a change in the presidency isn't going to change how much mo most people read um and joe hit something on the head like most people don't pay close enough attention to politics which is lamentable you know but it's a topic for other places or whatever but like cell phone games social media tv movies they're not going to be going away unless biden's like no more of all of that you all have to pay attention to me right i mean people have been far more distracted by those things in the past even during the last four years than they have been pol by politics and so <laughs> as i like swallow my lung um yeah i just don't think it's i just i don't i don't agree i don't think it's going to be that huge of a difference all right, so the next prediction is that consolidation in traditional publishing drives more authors to self-publishing and vanity presses. The big four publishers are about to become the big three with Penguin Random House's pending acquisition of Simon & Schuster. In slow growth or overcrowded markets, consolidation yields greater efficiencies, profits, and competitive advantages for the surviving entities. The combination will give Penguin Random House about 30% of the US book market, with fewer publishers bidding for the best books, it means fewer opportunities and lower advances for authors interested in a traditional publishing deal. And I, you know, I don't have a lot to say about this. We actually just had a show with Jane Friedman on, and I think she kind of addressed this a little bit. So definitely check out that episode if you haven't already. I think the gist of it was, and I kind of feel, I don't know, maybe the same way as someone who's completely outside of traditional publishing and not paying a huge amount of attention, I will admit to that. But I feel like there's, I'm not sure there's going to be that huge of a change. It just feels like things have been trending this way for a while. And uh, so it's probably going to be more of the same, you know, and it seems like when they merge, they don't necessarily get rid of the specific lines. Um, so I don't know how many fewer opportunities will be, but I, it's worth uh, paying attention to for sure. It, it could be, he could be right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I definitely agree that fewer major publishers means fewer major advances, but I think it's going to be primarily the sort of thing that affects the number, the upper 1%, like big shot traditional authors. Something tells me the rest of authors are going to see marginal shifts at best. It's also worth pointing out that while the, uh, the, you know, the distribution is contracting, the market isn't contracting, nothing about this is going to decrease the number of readers and therefore the number of books is going to have to remain relatively the same in order to feed those readers. So uh, yeah, I think it'll be a small change, but not, not something that's going to like, not a thing that any of us are likely to notice. Um, I mean, having any form of big publishers at all makes things better for indie authors, at least in my opinion. Uh, we can watch how they respond to current events and either adapt similarly or adapt in totally different areas or adapt at all while they don't adopt adapt at all whatever you know and also their higher prices they are still higher do make indie author books more attractive um, plus even though there will be fewer opportunities for authors who want to go traditionally published like he said there are still opportunities to go trad and then my last thought on this is is it's not just about the big publishers. There are so many legitimate successful publishers who aren't one of the big ones and who are alive and kicking and doing really well, honestly. So, I mean, it's not just about those guys. So just, yeah, keep that in mind. It is good to uh, pay attention though, what he was talking about with the vanity presses. It seems like those guys are always trying to scam somebody every year. Um, you know, there are some that are just, horrible <laughs> and david cochran i think has some lists he's outed a lot of these guys author solutions and the like so uh, i know none of you guys listening to this podcast you're you're in the know you're you're not going to get fall for that but it is tough for new people who just want to get like their memoir published and they go search on google and boy those vanity presses have done their seo and paid for the marketing because they're making ten thousand dollars or whatever on every author they uh, sign um so they they come up in the searches so you know I guess we can just warn people if they come to us and ask questions. 
All right, next prediction that we snagged from his list is that book discovery continues to shift from organic to inorganic. There was a time when most online book discovery was organic. If a quality read attracted enough readers, their purchases and reviews would cause the online store's algorithms to elevate the book's visibility to other readers. Today, the ebook market is dominated by a single toll taking re retailer that grants preferential discoverability to authors and publishers that pay tributes in the form of paid advertising and exclusivity. Other, retails will other retailers will face pressure to do the same. Um, authors are very upset about this. <laughs> I don't blame them, but it's weird because I, I don't feel this way because I honestly never had, <clears throat> I never had it easy when I got started. There were no ways to advertise. So we, I was in the exact same boat. Like I, I would have scraped together some money if there had been anything. I still remember Kindle Nation Daily was the one and only sponsorship site. And they, they actually moved some books back then. Um, but, you know, that was it. Um, so you know, I, I guess we're, we're upset because we kind of had the free ride in the beginning, though, like I said, those of us who wrote the cross genre stuff that didn't rank in any categories and, like I said, had no way to advertise back then, we, we struggled just as much then as new authors do now. So, you know, if you have a business that doesn't have to advertise or hustle like crazy on social media to be really creative and get catch on and get your product discovered, Man, you are a unicorn. That that's like super rare. It's kind of weird that we as authors should think we don't have to do those things. We just put our book out and it'll be magnificent and people will find it and get it in droves. There are no other businesses like that. So it's just kind of a fact of life. And it's tough because a lot of us, when you're getting started, I was the same way. I really shoestring that first book. I only paid like two hundred dollars for editing, and that was a lot. And the editing was quite horrible. But um fortunately, you know, over time you hopefully make some sales and you're gradually able to make Make enough that you have a little bit more when you launch the second series and you can put it into advertising or if you have a good day job and you're able to kind of finance your launch to some extent that's an option but I, I think we just have to accept that this is how business works advertising is just something you're gonna have to dedicate a portion of your budget to I do think there are still ways to get discovered out there uh, there are still lots of people that will go surfing through the free list look for the freebies you know we talk about the perma free book one all the time if you're wide and a lot of people don't have a lot of success with that. But honestly, if the book is really, if it's a really good book, it works. It still works. If it's, eh, you know, uh, then no, people are going to try a couple of paragraphs and not read anymore and not go on to buy the other books. So uh, that's an option too. But um, I, I think you just kind of have to put that in the budget, a little bit of advertising, you know, either with the launch, trying to get things rolling or just a little bit each month to try to, keep getting a few sales, trying to keep getting a few fans at a time so that when you're ready to launch that next series, you've got the newsletter, you've got the fans on it. But uh, you do need to realize that you have to make sure you have a good product before you dedicate a lot of money and, and throw a lot of advertising dollars at it. This is why businesses do like focus groups that have test products and all kinds of things before they really commit to spending a whole lot of money. And they know at that point that they have something worth investing marketing dollars in. We as authors just kind of assume, well, we like our book, so obviously everybody else is going to like it, and it's completely and worth investing in and spending a lot of money on. But that's why we're going to talk a little bit down below and the kind of doing it lean as lean as you can and making sure you have something viable that people are going to enjoy before committing a lot of money to it. Uh, go ahead, Joe. I rambled again. Uh, I agree with, with what was said. I don't have too much to add in that regard, but I would like to take a moment to ruminate on the meanings of words and how they change because in the context of this statement, uh, this prediction, organic discovery is referring to the algorithm. And in, in my head, it would have basically only referred to word of mouth, or I suppose browsing also. But it, it just feels strange that you know an artificially intelligent book sorting heuristic gets to go into the organic discovery basket now. Yeah, I, I agree. I've, I when I read that, I was like, um, "Yeah, I don't understand." <laughs> anyway, so um, I totally agree with Lindsay and Joe on this. Both people have always had to pay to get their businesses discovered, with the exception of the rare unicorn, like Lindsay was saying. And organic discovery is actually word of mouth, not an algorithm. But I mean, that was basically my only thought. Was I'm like, why does he think that's an algorithm? That's not an algorithm. <laughs> 
Well, and that's probably why I was disgruntled when I got started, because I didn't fit nicely into epic fantasy or anything the algorithm or, you know, the readers were looking for and, and it was going to be easy to promote. So it certainly was easy days for those who were just kind of spot on with books that were basically written to market and fit right into the categories on, on the sites and were, you know, inexpensive, good covers, easy to find and all that. Uh, okay, next prediction is subscription services to drive devaluation. For indie authors, two of the three major subscription services, Kindle Unlimited and Kobo, what's the name of their thing, guys? KP, Kobo, Kobo Plus, Kobo Plus. <laughs> That's what I get for putting initials in. Pay via a pool model in which the provider pays less than a 70% royalty from the pool to authors and publishers. This means devaluation. Readers can enjoy your book risk free for less cost than a single copy purchase and you earn a lower effective royalty rate for the read. This contrib contributes to a double devaluation of your books. Readers become accustomed to consuming books for what feels like free and the author is paid less per read. Not all authors can make up the difference with higher unit consumption because there are only so many readers to go around. So my thoughts on this and you know there's been a lot of talk about subscription services and we discussed this before in another episode but if it's not working for you just put some of your catalog into the subscription programs and count those books as your loss leaders because you're not going to make as much on them if this is true and you're not getting as many sales. I, I wouldn't necessarily risk reader ire by breaking up a series, but let's say you have three series, maybe you just have one in a subscription uh, service this year, whether that's KU or Kobo Plus or uh, anybody else that comes along, uh, maybe that you have the choice for uh, in the, I don't know, what, I don't even know what else is out there. I think Scribd, I've, I've never used it. Um, uh, you know, so you don't have to be all in with any of these services and that, uh, that way people that become fans that find you that way, because maybe there is improved visibility and discoverability by being in the subscription programs, um, but they'll be forced to buy the rest if they want them. Uh, just put samples of them in the ends of the books that are in the program and, you know, talk them up a little bit. Uh, you know, you're not going to get everybody. Some people are only going to get authors that they can get with their $10 a month subscription, but if somebody becomes a real fan of your work, which after they read, say, six books in a series, let's hope they are, then they're going to go, OK, I, I either have to go buy these or I get pirate copies somewhere and uh, you're never going to get that reader anyway. Right. So that's my solution for this is just put some of your stuff in there and don't put everything in there. Uh, there's also the argument to be made that people who use book subscription services and people who buy copies of books aren't completely the same pool of authors, and so there's of, of uh, sorry readers, and therefore they're they're not necessarily directly poaching each other. Some readers are simply more accustomed to purchasing books. Like several of the people that I bought Christmas presents for, only read books and paperbacks still. In fact, I, one of the people I bought Christmas presents for only reads large print paperback. So there are people who are going to be, you know, who are uh, dedicated and loyal to certain uh, markets and they're just never going to be a part of the other one. On the other hand, there are people who didn't read regularly until they were able to do so uh, you know, efficiently and, and it, you know, on a tight budget with the script, subscription services. And so you never had those as an, an option unless you joined the subscription. It's probably true that subservice is going to devalue books a little bit more because, again, um, you, you, you can get a book much more economically in a subscription service. And therefore, if you're going to try to get them outside of the subscription service, then your more expensive book is going to be less enticing. So you might consider lowering your price. But it's also a little disingenuous to kick up a lot of fuss about the fact that, that books might get this devalued because one of the things that gave indie authors their foothold at, at the beginning was our ability to compete on price. And it's one of the things we still have over, over uh, major publishers. So at some point, we're just talking about a matter of degree when it comes to devaluation. Uh, you know, a little bit is good, but a lot is bad. Well, if you can make a living at it, then any amount is, is survivable. You just have to know how to handle it correctly. Yeah, what Joe said. Um, I think we mentioned this in the past, but KU has replaced the library for some people. A lot of people will always go the cheapest route possible out of necessity, not because they're dishonest or trying to exploit the favorite author, their favorite authors or whatever, but because that's just the way it is. And, <clears throat> and just because a company offers an option for them doesn't mean that company's evil, though I don't know. Amazon probably is. <laughs> Unfortunately, Amazon was on the ball and the libraries weren't. Um, if Overdrive had been a thing from the very beginning, most readers would be getting their free books there rather than KU. Um, and luckily, K Overdrive is getting bigger, at least for my local library system. So that's really good. But seriously, people are still going to be going through 
I mean, they're, they're going to be getting their books through KU if, yeah, the train of thought left and it's on to Lindsay now. <laughs> Well, and it's a good point too. Like, actually, we can kind of blame libraries and tradition, probably traditional publishing. The libraries were probably just forced to work with them. That said from the beginning, if you buy two licenses or whatever for ebooks, your patrons can only check out those two at a time until they're turned back in. When that was artificially creating a shortage, right? You you know, sell them however many you want, but then just let everybody who goes to the library and wants to borrow the book borrow the book. None of this waiting for it to be turned back in, like it's a physical product that somebody has to drive up to the bin and drop it in before the next person can check it out so we actually the whole rise of KU is possibly the fault of uh, traditional publishing in the system they set up with the libraries also the fact that the libraries like uh, we, we said didn't really get on the ball that quickly with uh it was very slow and clunky to use I still remember my mom like eight years ago I was trying to help her figure out how to check ebooks out from the library and then get them on her kin and I was like gosh <laughs> let's get a post-it note no we're gonna need like three post-it notes because there's a lot of steps in my mind you know and I felt I thought it was a pain in the butt as someone who's not that scared of the tech stuff um, but just kind of wrap up to wrap up thoughts on this part of the episode so there were a lot more predictions and we will link to the post in the show notes and honestly even though we kind of rebutted or refuted some of them um, Mark was right with a lot of things I just don't think that I mean he has this very it came across to me as very pessimistic very doom and gloom and it's not there, there things are changing there's still plenty of opportunities you just have to realize that um, yes the industry is maturing there are more books in the marketplace but we have to be creative and think of ways to work around these obstacles it's not just he who has the most money is, is going to necessarily win like uh, yes that's an advantage if you're on your fourth series and now you're making a lot more and you can spend afford to spend a lot more on a launch, of course, that's going to help you. But as we're going to talk about below, it's not like you have to be a huge bestseller in order to make money from your eBooks. So, you you know, like we were talking about as a, as a business, which is what we are, we have to figure out how to be creative, how to hustle, how to build a following on social media and elsewhere, not just of random people, but of our fans. We have to like direct them to the places where we want them to hang out and kind of create a sense of community. And of course the newsletter, and it's just always going to be this way for authors. And, you know, if, if we as authors can't be creative when it comes to finding ways to get our books out in front of people, what does that say about us? We should be some of the most creative people out there. Instead, there's like 16 year olds on TikTok making 20,000 a month because they, they're the ones figuring it out. It's like, okay, we're not going to get on TikTok, most of us, but there are ways out there. So we just have to uh, be creative and, and figure out what works, uh, especially if you don't have a big uh, budget for advertising. Uh, go ahead, Joe. There's not much I can add to that. Um, I, I feel like I should just write a tweet, and maybe I will after this show. Uh, I predict that in the, f the coming year, things will become slightly more difficult, and we will need to overcome those difficulties by watching for new opportunities and improving our utilization of existing ones. And then every New Year's, I can just retweet that, because I think it'll be pretty evergreen. Yes, um, I love that. That's great. Uh, yes, and that's actually true. That's the way it is always going to be. Um, and as Lindsay said, authors need to be creative, um, not necessarily like with writing, though, obviously there, but with thinking outside the box where marketing is concerned and they need to be organized and they need to be self-educated. Uh, the better you understand how things work, the better you'll be at getting your books into, into the hands of readers. And if you're the type to complain about needing to market to find readers, that's like a woodworker complaining about needing to find wood or needing to obtain wood to make things. Because whether we like it or not, marketing is part of owning a business. If you want to write because you love it and you don't want to learn to market, that's completely fine. Uh, just be honest with yourself. Don't be annoyed with readers and or the system when people don't organically find your books. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you already know all of this. You need to be honest with yourself from the outset. The chances of your books taking off and reaching thousands of readers without you learning how to boost them to those readers are incredibly slim. So coming to the grips with this realization can be very freeing because you're like, I don't know. It's just part of just realizing that you don't have to wait on chance anymore. You can actually take the bull by the horns and make things happen. And it just depends on how well you, how good you are at pivoting and applying yourself to learning something new. All right. And with that, we will move on to our actual topic of the show. <laughs> that was a long half hour long pre topic. Um, but hopefully this will be useful to a lot of you. Uh, just to remind you, since it's been a half hour, our kind of main topic is what to do if you're not making a profit from your books. And this is not necessarily talking about your first book. That's going to be hard for almost everyone. And I think we should expect that 
you know, uh, as new authors, don't have high expectations. Like if it does better than you thought, great, you'll be excited. But if you thought, oh man, it's going to make 5,000 a month and I'm going to be quitting the day job at the end of the year, then you're very likely going to be disappointed and it's hard to stay excited and keep doing the grind. I hate to call it a grind because uh, I love writing. I love making up stories. I think it's the coolest job you could possibly have. But you know, it is, it's like you're doing the same thing over and over again, like any job, like any business that you start and you have to be willing to do that. But so we're kind of talking about here is what happens if you've written a series, you publish a series or maybe two series and you've got quite a few books out, but you're still financing your book production and marketing out of basically the income from your day job or supportive spouse or parents or whatever you're lucky enough to have. So that's not the, you know, that's not ideal. Assuming you actually care about making money. Like Andrea said, if that's not your goal, no biggie, uh, but you know, you probably care. And so the ideal thing is that your books earn out soon after you publish them. And then everything after that is profit. And like we've talked about, I know there's a lot of pessimism out there right now about it being pay to play. And some people are saying it's a winner take all market. But I think if ever, if there was an industry where that's not true, I'm going to argue that it's with books. Uh, you've probably heard or read Chris Anderson's book, The Long Tail, Why the Future of Business is Selling Less of More. And this is an old book. I read it probably in like 2008. I think it came out back then. So the idea is that yes, there are bestsellers and yeah, you probably have to throw a lot of money at something in most cases for it to become potentially a bestseller. But ever since it became possible to buy basically every book that's ever been written or that's still, you know, as long as it's still in print, every book, every movie, every TV show, et cetera, that's been published at the click of a button while you're at home in your pajamas, there has become a market for non-bestseller titles. If you've got enough products, even niche products, you can make a career out of being not a bestseller. Uh, of course, it always helps to become well known and then over time, hopefully a large, a large, a mass, a large fan base, not arguing against that. That's a great goal to have. Everybody should have that goal. But like I said, there are a lot of authors you've never heard of that are selling enough to make a living. And that's still true with people, people starting today. It's not going to happen off of one book. Very rarely it lightning strikes, but for most people, it's not even going to happen off of 10 books. Um, you guys probably know the 20 books to 50K Facebook group. The whole idea behind that was like, maybe by the time you have 20 books published, you might be able to make 50,000 a year. So, in, you know, unless you're great at marketing on the side, but most of us have kind of come into this not knowing a lot about that or specifically about book marketing. So it's really, if you feel like there's a lot to learn, it's because there is. And I know we kind of just go jumping into assuming you guys know everything when you're listening to this podcast, because we're not really trying to be a beginner show. But you should be able to work, learn things over time. And with each new book and series that you release, things should get better. And if they don't, we're going to talk about that coming up below. Uh, some of the things you can check and see if that sounds like you. And I don't mean to say that like everybody's going to just make a living, every author. They won't. Most people upload a book and will not make anything. But again, if you're here listening to this podcast and writing and, and the craft podcast out there and you're trying to improve not just your marketing, but your books with each new one, you know, realize that you're not average, you're not that person. Um, also, and I don't know if this is encouraging, if things are hard, maybe it's not, I probably would have rolled my eyes if uh, I gave myself this advice 10 years ago, but we are selling as in these digital products and there are costs associated with the initial production and ongoing costs. Uh, if you advertise, if you choose to advertise, but there's really no other business out there where it's easier to be profitable. Other businesses have to buy raw materials, lease a manufacturing facility, and pay tons of people to produce and fulfill orders. And they have to ship things. And these are kind of ongoing expenses, not kind of, they are ongoing expenses that are they have every month forever. Physical products are super low margins. And, and then you've got the service industry that requires you to trade your hours for dollars. In comparison to all that stuff, selling digital projects, products is amazing. <laughs> There's zero cost involved in scaling up. Meaning it doesn't cost you any more to sell 10,000 ebooks of your newest release uh, than it costs to sell 10 ebooks of the same title. So if ever you're going to make it in business, selling digital products really is the most viable road to getting there. Um, as I said, fiction is art, art is subjective. So you have to like, you do have to be able to create a product that people will enjoy. Otherwise, you're always going to be pushing a boulder up a mountain. 
But a lot of times when I see people struggling and saying on forums that, you know, they're really bitter that it's pay to play and they can't get anywhere because they don't have a lot of money to spend. Usually when I check their book pages, I would say 90, or 75% of the time, I'm like, yeah, I'm not surprised that this author is not selling well. The covers often aren't professional or the blurbs are awkward and not appealing. Uh, maybe the other 25% of the time it takes me getting to the sample chapters to see what's up. And then it's a plotting beginning full of info dumps or some first person present tense in a cross genre setting that is not very popular. So, you know, it's just if you set yourself up with that, with the, the craft side not being there, then you're going to be pushing that boulder uphill and it is going to be harder to get those books to sell. But uh, we can keep improving as authors. <laughs> there are a lot of things that, you know, get better. I think it's just being not stubborn, and we'll talk about this more, and being willing to experiment and try everything. But we've, we have a little list, but before we jump into that, uh, why don't you, do you guys have any thoughts on whatever I've been rambling on? <laughs> I, I think, you know, we're definitely in a profession where you can get your products out on an absolute shoestring budget and then leave them out there forever. And uh, while this is less true now than it was 10 years ago, there's also nothing stopping any individual one of your books from suddenly selling thousands of copies per day. Someone can mention it on, uh, you know, on the internet or it can, any number of things could suddenly push it into the public consciousness. And then without you even noticing or doing anything, you're selling thousands of books a day or, or a thousand books in a day. Uh, in a lot of businesses, the two worst things that can happen to you are too little business and too much business. Like even if you were a self-published author who only had paperbacks, if suddenly 10,000 people wanted paperbacks and you only had 100, well, not only did you fail to make as much money as you could have, but you angered, you know, thousands of people who wanted something and couldn't get it. So doing your work digitally or on demand completely eliminates the concerns of being able to meet demand. So if things start to go well, scaling is automatic. And that's a tremendous asset for our industry. It really is. That's, and there's something really comforting about that to know that like if your book goes huge overnight, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to worry about warehouse. You also don't have to worry about like stock in a warehouse. If your book doesn't, if your book doesn't go huge overnight, you don't have 10,000 copies sitting in your garage somewhere. Um, I've never been a big bestseller. I've scraped onto the USA Today list once or twice, but I worked really hard for that to happen. And it honestly didn't do anything long-term to help my career. Um, though, I mean, when I was writing this down, writing my thoughts down on this, I was like, well, maybe it has. Honestly, I can't, I don't know how I'm going to find out. Like, for example, how many of those readers have stuck around and boosted my sales? I don't know. And I don't have a way to find out without directly asking them. And it's been so many years that they're not going to remember. Um, but even though none of my books have made the news or really garnered attention, like Lindsay said, like Lindsay said, Andrea's made a career out of it. <laughs> like she's said, though, um, it's possible to make a career out of not being a bestseller seller. So things built up. And over the course of several, several years, I made really good money off of my books. Uh, the thing that a lot of people don't realize is this. It's going to take um, more than one book, more than one series, and a lot of work to make money. And even if you've made a lot of money in the past and that has dried up, you'll find you need to pivot and put the work in again. And that's discouraging. Yes, it is. I'm, I'm kind of there right now. Um, but it's part of the business. And, it's, and being able to change when something is no longer working is just, I mean, that's just, you own your own business. That's what you're going to have to deal with. So, I mean, for example, styles change. The same kind of furniture and art and carpet and even wall paint changes. People who create those things need to change to meet current demand. So don't, don't think that this is all unique and go into a pity party and, oh, you have to change everything. That's just the way it is when you're running a business. And then about Lindsay's comment on a book's product page, you know, product page, description, cover, and sample, et cetera. Um, it's very difficult for authors to recognize when something they've got or something that they absolutely love is holding them back. It takes a great deal of courage to step back and look at our books with a critical eye or to ask someone to give us honest feedback. There are so many absolutely fantastic authors out there uh, who write really great books and yet insist on buying the cheapest, most homemade looking book covers ever. And, but because they love those book covers and or they're unwilling to pay for something that would work better or maybe they're hesitant to try. I've been there. Actually, I've been there for all of this. Um, you know, I, I've been really cheap in the past. I've, I've been, I've insisted on using homemade book covers. I did get better. Actually, I got really good. I won an award for one of my book covers. Um, but it's very hard to recognize what is stopping us when something is stopping us. It's very difficult to step outside of ourselves and be critical about something we've created. And so my advice here to do 
uh, my advice here is to do this. So if you're, you have a book that's not selling or a series that's not selling, run a test on Facebook. So take that book and, and go and find a genre, the, the same genre, go find a book in that genre that is selling really well, copy the book cover, put it in an ad to a specific audience, make, make it sure that is the audience for that book and your book and send traffic to that book. Yes, you're going to be giving them money, right? But see how it does for a week or even up to like 1500 impressions. Then do the same with your own book. Use the same audience, put just your book cover, use similar text in the ad and direct traffic to your own book. Then see how things go for a week or about 1500 impressions. If the other book got a lot more covers or sorry, a lot more clicks, then your book cover is the problem. And then if, if the clicks were roughly the same, then try your description, do the same thing, have their description in one ad, your description, another, if you don't get some, a similar number of clicks, you need to work over your description and you can do the same thing with your sample and theirs, though. I'm not sure of the legality on this part of you copying. Maybe you can ask them if you can, you know, send traffic to their, you know, tell them what you're doing and like, it'll be a way to get traffic going to your book and then just see if they say yes. If they say yes, then do the same thing. And then you can test if it's the first part of your book that's stopping people from downloading. But, and, and through all, all, all of that testing or whatever, it's important they use the correct audience for both books. So an audience that actually wants to read those books, and then you need to use the same audience for both books. So if you use an audience for one book, use that same audience for the other one. And I don't usually recommend you ask a trusted friend or ex expert in the industry, honestly. And I have a caveat on this below because I know we're going to talk about this more below um, where it you can use somebody to ask advice from. But my main, my main reason for that is this. Most people you'll have access to have built-in prejudices that taint how we see something or how they see something. And their advice or our advice, whatever, might not represent how your readers feel. And then also when you ask for, free, for feedback, the person you're asking is automatically put in a critical state of mind, which is a different mindset from the knee-jerk, I must buy this book or, ooh, this book is disgusting reaction that you're looking for. So, I mean, that's one reason why I like to use Facebook so much for ads to test things out is because people don't know they're being tested. So it doesn't put them in that critical mindset. Um, but like I said, I have a caveat on that below and I'll talk about that later. I mean, people who are, anyway, we'll go into it later. Let's, let's go on. Sorry, moving on. No spoilers. <laughs> no, I, I really like that idea of like uh, doing a Facebook ad that's to the popular book. <laughs> you know, that's kicking and kicking butt in the store in your category and then running your own without changing anything else. <laughs> and uh, seeing that that maybe that's like a scientific way to do it. Uh, then you also don't have to go ask anybody for help if you feel awkward doing that, which many of us introverts have a hard time doing that. And extroverts, I don't like asking for people's suggestions and feedback. I'm like, I don't want to hear it. Let's see what the unan anonymous people, anonymous people are saying. Okay, so introverts and extroverts have a problem with that. So I guess that's all human beings. <laughs> all right. So first thing in our list here, Andrew already gave some good tips, but um, just ask yourself: Are you doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? Um, if you've published a number of books that haven't earned out and you've already tried a lot of the obvious things we've been talking about, like new blurbs, maybe new covers, maybe re rewriting the opening chapters, then it's time to try something else. Um, if you want to make money, again, assuming that's your goal, you can't keep doing the same thing again and again if what you're doing is not working. So try another genre or another style, a new series, something to change it up. Uh, there are a lot of indies who bombed their first series and honestly a lot of traditionally published authors too I've, every now and then I'll like see some epic fantasy author just killing it and you'll look back and you find out they had like an epic fantasy series before they ever got into epic uh, urban fantasy and you're like gosh nobody's read that and it has hardly any reviews so that didn't work out well for them and then they switched to another subgenre within their genre and they took off so I've actually seen that happen a lot uh, with authors so it's you know this is not necessarily to say you have to go to something that's super popular but like I said, maybe you switch from epic fantasy to urban fantasy, or if you're not having trouble in urban fantasy, paranormal romance, or maybe you go to epic fantasy. Sometimes it's just trying something different and that just seems to work. Maybe your voice is honestly better suited, your style and your voice to the other type, the second thing that you try. Uh, so yeah, just don't be afraid to try something new, all new series, all new genre if you have to, and, and try again. And again, you're always learning along the way, hopefully doing the craft stuff whether uh, doing writing workshops, if that's an option, or if you like to read my books or just listen to lectures. I don't know if anybody's going to classes right now, but there's probably some online ones. 
you know, I think we have to continue to try to be aware and improve our, our work. And that's just something to some extent that's going to happen over time, but you do have to put in conscious effort to get better at something. You can't just assume just writing a million words is all you need to do. You have to be trying to learn to improve your skills uh, and working towards that. Go ahead, Joe. It's also important to remember how malleable digital products are. We're talking earlier about how having digital projects products is so useful. If you do find success, even minor success with one of your books, remember that you might be able to take the lessons that you've learned from that and apply it to your earlier attempts. Like I wouldn't recommend, you know, changing all of the things uh, that you experimentally did on all of the other books. But uh, there's value in brushing up the old stuff once you know what works, especially if it's something cheap or free, like just changing your blurb. So yeah, like w when you try the new thing and it works, that's a, a, a new tool in your tool set, which might have retroactive results. Okay, so someone might get caught up on the point. Um, I've tried different things. I've tried different marketing plans and release schedules and all of that. And one of the biggest things I've noticed is people they kind of half heart their plans. They don't put everything into their decision. They kind of, they're like afraid of failure. They're, they're afraid to give everything in, put everything into it. So they hold part of themselves back. And it's possibly out of feel of fear of failure. Like I said, and, and the problem with doing this is that you're not giving an honest try. So your results aren't going to accurately, accurately represent what would have happened had you given it your all. Um, that said, it's really hard to give her all to something and, and fail at it. Like my launch for Midnight Chronicles, I put a lot of everything into it and it still failed. Um, and then also another thought that just popped in my mind. I mean, you don't have to like kill yourself over stuff. Like sometimes a series just isn't ever going to do anything, even if you put your all into it. And so marketing, when you're writing, when you're marketing something that's really easy, it's going to make it, it's going to be easier, but we're talking about books that are hard to market right now. So, and how to get something. Yeah. Anyway. So, sorry. That's what happens when I kill myself in the middle of a podcast. I lose my train of thought. <laughs> right. And I think too, as an indie author, you don't necessarily need to worry so much about the launch unless you're doing like rapid release, like I often do. And you really want, this is like a big chance to, you know, throw a bunch of money at it if you have it and try to get things really rolling and off to a good start. But that's really for more, most people are going to be doing that with their second series or their third series. The first one, a lot of time you just put it out there start writing the second one. Maybe you'd, you know, run a inexpensive Amazon ad to book one. Uh, you know, this is not to say you, can't try a lot and, and do things. And if you want to arrange newsletter swaps and you think you have a good shot at it, go for it. But realize that when you put a lot of effort into marketing and you only have one book in that series, there's only so much you can earn uh, per person off of that one book. Whereas we've talked about this before, maybe you just want to have like a light launch on your first book, get the second one out, get the third one out. Maybe with the fourth one out, it's time to really push uh, book one. And maybe you're ready to run a sale on it at that time. And at that point, it's worth more time and effort and money going into the marketing because they can go on and do full price of all the, you know, all the, Andrew's asking me questions in the chat. No, the dogs are sleeping. Ah, as I've distracted myself, we'll just move on to the next one, <laughs> which we already tried to move on to once. Are you spending too much on the packaging? And again, I was talking about covers, like we of course want you to have a professional cover, but you can go out there and find good pre-made covers for your genre. There are a lot of cover artists out there that have Facebook groups where they're putting out their art, uh, you know, so just poke around, ask in our Facebook group for some recommendations uh, for cover artists that do pre-mades. Just go surfing around, find one that works for you. Uh, you know, hopefully often they'll be able to do a whole series based on that one. And usually these are just, pho just Photoshop manipulation. I don't mean to say that's there's anything wrong with that, but there's usually using stock art and Photoshop manipulation. So even if you find the first one and you have to pay for custom ones beyond that, it's probably going to be less expensive than you're like, oh, I'm doing epic fantasy. I have to do thousand dollar custom artwork to have a shot. And that is something that you can do after the book is proven to sell well and people are liking it like Joe's talked before about how he launched a series and I think you put the money as soon as you started earning some money you're like let's get better covers and that make a huge difference but you were earning money before you did it versus charging a bunch on a credit card or whatever until you've kind of got a product that's proven you know you don't want to be in the situation where you go into debt for this like I remember someone probably like back in 2012, 2013, spending $10,000 for a full cast production of his first audiobook. 
Now, to be fair, he had good ebook sales to start out with, but he did not earn out on that audiobook, and he has fallen off the map now and not published anything new in years. If you go into debt big time early on, it's going to discourage you and leave you struggling to pay that off. So publish as lean as you can. Still get a professional cover. Like I said, pre-mades from professional cover designers are a good way to go. And then once you've kind of proven that the product is working with people, you're getting good reviews, you're getting people emailing you to ask what happens next. And above all, you're getting sales because honestly, reviews and eh, emails, emails are nice, but you want to see the sales, the money is coming into the bank. Then you can invest it into new covers and spend more on all the things it, it, once the book is profitable. Yeah, with, with the exception of covers, I fall incredibly far on the don't spend much on an individual book side of the, uh, of the spectrum. I used to say that my budget for a book release was $5,000, and that included the cover, the edit, all the promo and all that. And I don't think I've ever hit that number. Uh, but it turns out even my covers are reasonable compared to some folks. Uh, I believe I've mentioned this on previous episodes, although probably not uh, recently. Uh, a few years ago, my free wrench books, which are steampunk, were doing very well so well that another author contacted me about doing a collaborative series and i we talked for a while i decided it was worth giving it a shot we worked through some basic info and agreed to co-fund the whole thing right down the middle we would all pay for half of everything and then he insisted that we hire an artist who charge five thousand dollars for their illustrated covers and this guy it's, this is an artist that had an artist's agent like i wasn't talking to the artist i was speaking through an agent and we started the book and therefore, even before the edit, we were $5,000 in the hole as a, as a pair. And I hadn't spent that much on the full production and release of anything. And like, not just each any individual book in Free Wrench, which is, did well enough to get his notice, the entire series at that point hadn't cost me $5,000. Um, so not only did, you know, this, this was evidence that the book was perhaps not being managed properly. And not surprisingly, I can't tell you the name of that book because it never came out, or at least it didn't come out in the way that we that we uh, intended. Uh, oddly enough, I got my money back because the guy ended up selling the IP. He was a he was a wheeler and a dealer, I suppose. He ended up selling the IP to somebody else who wanted to own everything associated with it. So they actually bought back my half of the cover. So I ended up with zero, but zero is much better than negative two, uh, 2,500. The point is, even if we finished the book, we would have had to sell 20 times as many copies of that book to get to zero as I had to sell to become successful enough to earn the, the you know, the guy's uh, respect to write this book to begin with. So, yeah, you just be careful with how much you spend on a book unless you are certain that it's going to be a good investment. That... <laughs> Okay, so when I was reading your notes on that, I was like, holy cow, I can't believe that had $5,000. Holy crap. I, yeah, that is so insane. Um, and lucky, really, really lucky that you got that money back. <laughs> um, but the spending too much on the package thing is a trap I fell into with my Midnight Chronicles books. And I've talked about that already. Uh, I'm still not happy with the final product, but I've sunk so much money into that dang series. And I'm not, I'm just not willing to do it anymore. It's um, it's possible. Actually, it's very, very possible and never, ever pay me back. But luckily I was spending money we had, and we didn't need that money to survive. And I didn't go into debt to do it. Um, but still, dang it, what could I have done if I had that cash? Anyway, so honestly, especially when you're first starting out, putting a cheap cover on a series is better than spending a ton of money, ton of money to get the cover you've always wanted. And then especially when you're starting out, the author sorry, I'm going to have, I don't know how to say this, you know, tactfully. The author doesn't know what the best cover is for their series almost ever. Um, your idea for what is going to be really great for your series probably won't work. Like most of the authors I've talked to when they're first starting out, what they want is this really awesome illustration that their brother-in-law's best friend is going to do. And I've never seen one of those illustrations turn out to be professional enough to be on a book cover. So don't trust yourself when it comes to choosing a book cover Make sure the cover is good enough to catch attention. Use Facebook ads for that. Um, go, go, like, go see what's selling, and then contact the the artist who did those book covers, or go through like, you know, the book cover design marketplace group that I've talked about in the past to get pre mades and things like that. And then focus on writing more books, getting them well edited, and moving on. If that series ends up making money, reinvest back into the series, get better books, whatever. That's something Joe did when he first started out. And I know Lindsay already mentioned that, but Joe, you're double the, you know, the example right now. <laughs> I'm special. Right. And that's a good point on authors not knowing what to ask for in covers, because we always want a freaking scene authentic to the book 
completely represented on the cover with like eight symbols that are also important to the story. And I, I was the same way, like it's taken me a lot of years to even get like, I don't have the best eye for this stuff. So it's taken me a while to uh, realize that it's better just to ask the designer, especially now there is a whole industry built up with cover designers and they do tons and tons of covers in your genre. Just ask them, be like, give them a, this is what the character looks like. This is the feel I'm going for. And then just let them go with it. Uh, whether, you know, it's pre-made or, you know, ordering custom stuff, it, they'd probably give you recommendations. Like if you email them and say like, hey, do you have a pre-made that might work for this? They're probably gonna have a better recommendation than you, unless you have a, a design, even if you have a graphic design background though, if you're not necessarily coming out of the publishing industry, you, you may not quite know what's working out there in your genre and be super aware of it yet. All right, we got a few more of these and then we'll wrap up. This is turning into an epic show. So long that Andrea had to hang up on us at one point and, and come back. All right, next one is just the question, are you spending money on advertising when you've only got one book or the ads are just not converting well? And I've told you guys before that I have done series where ads on book one just don't convert that well. I, I On Amazon, I'm very iffy on stuff that's not in KU because it's even harder to make it work. And, you know, I talked about in the not to market episode how ads that are on books that are not to market, not, you know, specifically to trope or, you know, like in solidly in the, the category, don't usually do as well as the stuff that is. People like to you know, get more of what they know they like, the same but different. And so if your book is not really solidly to, to market and in the market, you may struggle with making that book convert and actually making any money uh, with the pay-per-click stuff. It's especially hard, even if your book is to market, to do it with only one book. Uh, you know, when you have the series and the read-through is good, then you've got more options. But I would just kind of wait, you know, wait, wait a few books down the road. Maybe it's even your next series that you're tinkering with that tend, that ends up being the one that just converts better. You probably have one, you know, how, no matter how many series you have, you probably got one or two that just there happen to be the thing. They, they connect better, they convert better. People click the ads, they buy the book, and then they read through the series. Um, and also there's a learning curve with ads. So don't try to learn everything on the launch of one book because it costs, it costs money to kind of learn what works and what, what doesn't. So just set a budget and try to learn a little bit with successive book launches. Don't get into the trap of throwing more and more money at it because you you think like, oh, if I just figure it out, I'm going to be rich. Writing more books is a more certain path to that. I mean, it's not certain anyway, but writing more books, you'll learn more as you go. You'll learn which ads work. Uh, I know it's a lot of work to write a book, but I don't know. I find it more peaceful and less stressful than playing with ads. Maybe I'm weird. I'm definitely weird, but um, you guys already know that. Moving on. to <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Uh, like learning to calculate the return on investment, including sell through, is by far the most important part of learning how to advertise. Like, yes, making an ad that works as well is hard, but you will never even know if you've made an ad that works well until you've learned how to define well. So yeah, you need to really keep an eye and learn exactly what makes a good ad and, and learn if your ad's actually making money for you. Like these, it's absolutely crucial if you're gonna be advertising at all to know how to get the, the you know, the metrics on how the ad's doing. Agreed, definitely. Um, and this is something I asked myself a lot in the beginning. How do you know if your book wouldn't do better if you just put it just put it in front of more readers? And I, I was like, well, if only the right people, you know, saw it over and over. So you can act, like run a promotion on it with one of the sites out there, like Book Barbarian, Robin Reads, ENT Free Books, Book Sends, et cetera, and see how people respond. How many downloads did you get? So if you got like 5,000 downloads, you can expect anywhere from, I'm not going to math, like one to five to 10% of those people to post reviews. So did you get any reviews out of those downloads? And then as an example, the key of Kalenia, that was the first book in my Kalenia series and it had thousands of downloads. I mean like thousands and it was a free book. It was a perma-free. So I wasn't like making any money off of that, but thousands and thousands and thousands of downloads, like a hundred, 200 thousands of downloads. And it only ended up with 200 reviews. The reviews were all positive there. It was a 4.7 star average, but the vast majority of people did not feel strongly enough to post a review or to go on and buy the next book. So how did I learn that this series wasn't pulling its weight? Um, by gaining experience in the industry, by listening when other authors talked and 
of course, by releasing series that did better. So listening when other authors talk, like if they get, you know, 20,000 downloads on a book, what do they, like how many reviews do they end up getting and how many people go on to buy the next book? I mean, it's really hard to know if your book would do better if you were just investing more money in, in advertising, but don't put money into a sinking ship. So when you realize it's not going to sell very well, don't put a ton of money into that. And then also don't put a ton of money into your very first series, write more books, gain more experience and see how things with consecutive books and series go. And then of course, above all that, there's that advice that that's kind of going throughout this, this kind of a back theme that we haven't really said, but be patient. It's not the end of the world. If your first book or first series, or even your first 10 books or 20 books aren't selling. Sometimes it takes a while to find the perfect genre and system and readers. All right, next up, do you truly have a good blurb and cover and sample pages? Have you asked others, and by others, I mean someone super familiar with your genre who's selling well for an opinion. Don't just freaking put your book up in a forum with everybody and ask for feedback on it. You wanna just ask the one person, pick the person. If they don't respond to you, pick another person that's selling well. And somebody that like, ideally they're doing podcasts and interviews and you've kind of heard them and they know, you know, they didn't just luck into things. I mean, you can kind of tell if you follow somebody's career long enough, like if they've been at the top of urban fantasy with every release and every new series for like five years, you're like, okay, they probably know something. It's probably not luck at this point. Um, you know, and maybe that person isn't going to respond, but a lot of people will, if, if all you're asking for is like, hey, is my cover suck? Is my blurb suck? Do you know why? Don't ask them to read the freaking book. Nobody wants to read your book that is not your target audience and authors are probably not it. Authors are probably, if they're going to read anything at all, it's going to be, they've got a t two book, what do you call it? TBD, to be read, to TBR stack of books they really want to read, not yours. Maybe someday it will be yours, but today it's not. So just but most people, it only takes them a couple minutes to like glance at the cover and the blurb and say, like, yeah, yeah, okay, this is probably what your issue is. And like Andrea said, a lot of people struggle with developing the kind of analytical muscle to like step back and be able to look at their own stuff objectively and see why it's not working. Uh, so if you can develop that, great. But uh, again, I just, at, at some point, it, it can be worth asking for advice. Although I do like Andrea's suggestion of uh, the Facebook ads with <laughs> the popular person's cover and then compare it to your cover. But, you know, if you actually ask, they might have a couple helpful tips uh, that you might be doing something that they did wrong in the beginning and they spot it right away. And if you do ask for advice, don't be too stubborn to take it. Like if, if you're not going to take the advice, don't even bother emailing them. But it's not really fair not to do that, not to try to make changes, not to try to figure it out and then kind of go complain in forums and infect everyone else with your pessimism. I know some folks who have a terrible habit of looking at the available information saying, nah, that doesn't feel right. And then just going their own way. If you've got flawless intuition, then great, go that way and reap your benefits. But chances are you, you know, you're, you were seeking advice for a reason, even you thought you needed it. And not all advice is going to be great advice, but you need to learn to assess your own views as objectively as you assess other people's views. So yeah, uh, just even if you don't 100% believe the advice you're getting, look at its merits and, and consider that maybe there might be something there. And this is where I was giving spoilers <laughs> uh, for the rest of the episode. The caveat to my advice above not to ask for input from other people. If the person writes this in the same genre as you and is successful, they're going to know at a glance almost always when something is off. Um, but here's the, the new little info. Just be careful when approaching these authors, especially if you're going to ask them to read your book. Um, there's nothing some people hate more than cold call email saying, hey, would you take the next 10 hours out of, out of your life and read my book that might be very not well edited and all of that. So, I mean, again, this is, I don't know, Lindsay, what would you tell people? What would you, how would you respond to people emailing you and saying, Hey, will you tell me what's wrong with my book? I usually tell them. <laughs> I mean, like if it gets lost, I'm horrible. You know, like if you get me when I'm in one of my cycles where I'm buried deep in my words and barely checking my email, you may not get an answer. Um, but you can try again in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I usually feel guilty the second time you're like, I emailed you once and you didn't answer. Um, but yeah, I just, if, if you're doing like high fantasy, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm enough of an expert. I bounce all over between the genres, but like space opera, I feel pretty comfortable with. But, um, you know, it's just, it's less of that's a lot less of a intrusion and a favor than like can you read my book your book could be amazing they still don't want to read <laughs> they're busy with their own lives so um but a lot of times people don't 
I don't know. I guess it depends. Uh, they might not mind just kind of glancing at your book page on Amazon and giving a few quick thoughts. Uh, like I said, if they don't, just email the next person on your list that's kicking butt in the genre and ask for their opinion. All right, let's go on to my next one. We're getting towards the end, finally, guys. Hope you're still listening. <laughs> Hope you're getting something out of this. Um, are you conflating price with value or failing to realize that price is only half of the equation? So many authors out there refuse to do free or 99 cent book ones. I don't know, it's out of pride. It's out of this. We're devaluing our books. But for someone who loves your story, the books are priceless. They'll get all of your full price releases and special editions in the future. It doesn't matter if they read your first book in the library, through a subscription program, or for free after clicking an email from a deal site. Value is what the reader ascribes to the story, not the price you put on the cover. And it's really more about the income you bring in each month. It has nothing to do with the price on the book. I mean, obviously, higher price books, you're going to make more money per sale. But if at a lower price or at a free book one, you're able to sell many more copies of the rest of the series than you could with a full price book one. Isn't it worth it to make more money? Why wouldn't you do it in that case? And this is not to say that perma-free is good for you know is the thing for everyone if you're doing fine with nothing free like if you're in KU I mean it's all free essentially anyway at that point for their ten dollars but you know if what you're working what you're doing is working that's fine this is you know this episode isn't really for you but for those who are struggling that have a series out that they aren't getting any headway on give the book free one the book one free a chance advertise the freebie on the deal sites that Andrea mentioned earlier and if that point um like I like Andrew Andrea's example there. I mean, I wouldn't worry so much about reviews. Actually, 200 re reviews seems pretty good. But if you're able to give away thousands of copies of a book one in and give them time, you know, give them a month or whatever. And if at that point you're not seeing anybody reading through or very few people reading through, the problem is probably that the book is not connecting with, with readers. They're not caring enough about the story to want to pay for the next installment. But usually it's, it's very typical for a read through to be re, re, quite low, even on a successful book one, like maybe 5%, 5 or 10% is pretty good. But that's why you're hoping to make up for like giving away thousands of copies. Suddenly you go from selling no copies of book two to maybe you're selling 100 a month of book two and three and four and the subsequent ones in the series. So that's why you do the book one to go from not selling hardly any copies of the series to potentially giving away a lot of book one in exchange for that 5% maybe going through and, and being willing to purchase the next books. Yeah, when I was having my absolute best years, uh, I was proud enough to say that for one of my series, I had a 12% read through from the free book one to the to the book two. So like that was a that, that you can have a career based on having a 12% read through on a really well downloaded uh, book one. Um, it, and it really does come down to the number at the end of the day. This is your business and what you care about is profit uh, when, if you're trying to keep your business going. Profit is your gains minus your losses. So if lowering your price raises your profit, you win. Like that's, you do what works. If it doesn't, by the way, then you don't win and you look into some other options. But always, if it's working, don't, don't be too precious about the price of your book. Yeah, a lot of people shy away from giving things away, but doing it is one of the best ways to gain new fans. I mean, this is why BookBub was created and it, and it, why it honestly works because people like deals. Right, I've got, I've got a thing here now. Uh, the question is, are you moving past failures? So it's important to look at what you've done and to see if there's ways that you can make it work. And as we've said elsewhere, the more books you have, the better chance you'll have at starting to turn a profit. So split your time between assessing your old books and producing new books. Way back before I self-published, I wanted to traditionally publish and I tried to get an agent and I did so for a, you know roughly five years off and on, just sending out query letters and then waiting until I either got a response that was a rejection because it was always a rejection or didn't get a response at all and just gave them enough time to, oh, well, they ignored it, I'll do the next one. And during that time, I wasn't writing any more books. Now, it just so happens I had three books already written when I was doing that. But five years, you know, the, the following five years, I wrote something like 20 books. And if I had just been continuing to hone my craft and continuing to move forward while things were going on, then I would have been a lot better off. Uh, so yeah, definitely look at the past and see what you can fix, but not if it stops you from moving forward and building your catalog. Yeah, failure has the power to cripple people. And for me, it drains my energy and, and will to try again. So talking about my most recent book failure, a lot of the time it just takes time. 
give yourself space and then grace if we, as we've said, and when you're ready again, get back to work or make any necessary changes. I think this goes a little bit back to me for the thing of doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. You have to be willing to accept that maybe this wasn't working and it's time to try something new, mix it up, uh, be willing to change. You know, even if you're not jumping to a different genre, trying a different angle within your genre, you know, it, it is tough to fail and to not succeed and to uh, continue to maintain enthusiasm when nobody's buying your books. So you kind of have to figure out like, well, what can you do to make it fun and exciting as you're learning, as you're trying new things to make you want to try again? So I think if you really, like I said before, I hate to think of it as a grind is at least the creative part, because if you feel that way about it, there are, there are easier ways to make money, guys. Um, this is not, you know, taking your art and trying to make a living from it is a hard thing. Even though we talked about how like, yes, digital products are great because they're a lot easier to sell and scale up and there's fewer expenses than with other types of business. It's still, it's art, it's subjective, it's hard. It's hard to accept that people may not love your art. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't really have any great advice about overcoming failures, except, you know, maybe trying something different will like keep you excited about it and keep you wanting to try and go ahead, Andrea. I think you got the last one. Yeah. So this is what my little question here for listeners was, have you cultivated the necessary skills to write books that people want to read? And that's kind of harsh to sound to say, and, and I don't like being the one to say it, but some authors aren't selling because they don't know how to write good books. Uh, this is a really tough one. It really, really hits home to me. I, I never took a creative writing class in the cre creative writing class. <laughs> and the very first thing I wrote that didn't have a business theme to it was my book, The Key of Kalenia. And guys, the feedback I got on that book, oh my gosh, it was, it was so hard. It was so hard to hear because that was my baby, dang it. Anyway, so it was really, really harsh in the beginning, but I was, I was so relentless with that. I rewrote it and rewrote it like six times, seriously. And even after it had been published for many years, I rewrote it again. And I'm, you know, I'm glad to say it's more than paying me back for the time I've put into it, but I had to put that necessary time into learning. And again, it's still not my best book, not by a long shot. So let's say you've delved in creative writing your whole life, but but here's a rude thing of me to say, um, just because you know how to write creatively, creatively doesn't mean you know how to write creatively the way your readers want their books to be written. A lot of us consume stories on a regular basis, but most of the time, especially when we're first starting out as writers, we aren't consuming those stories critically. So meaning we aren't just dissecting them and figuring out what makes them tick. And maybe we write perfectly for a genre we're not in. And Lindsay mentioned that earlier. Readers of the genre we are writing in won't connect as well with our books as those who would if we were writing to them. So change, you know, check your genre or whatever. Um, the best thing we can do here is to delve into a lot of things. And one of the biggest pieces of advice you'll get is to not write cross genre, but sometimes that's necessary to find where, um, where you or where we all, where we really belong, where readers will consume our books and, and we will be happiest writing there. Um, sometimes our passions aren't necessarily the thing we'll enjoy writing the most ultimately. And how will you know if you never try something else? Right. This is um, one of those things we're looking back. I'm glad self-publishing wasn't really a thing when I first got started and it, there was no viable path to that, but just put your books up on Amazon and uh, give it a shot. So, cause I had to join workshops, figuring traditional was the only way that I could go. That was the only option really. So I spent, you know, off and on years in, in workshops, getting learning, getting feedback, critiquing other people's stories. And that really helped me become a stronger writer. And I made some short story sales before the Kindle Claim Along, before I finished my first couple of novels. And, you know, even though they weren't to pro magazines and I got lots of rejections on, on short stories too, the fact that I was able to sell a few of them gave me a little bit of confidence that like, okay, it's not the writing that's holding things back. It's just the story didn't necessarily connect with every editor. So by the time I published my first book, which, you know, I would still say it's not amazing. It still feels like a first book. And there are things now I would do differently if I rewrote it, but it's, it's not the first book I wrote. I think it's about, it's the second one I finished. Uh, then there were lots of other ones I had started, but because I didn't just publish my first book, I think I had a better shot earlier on. Like I said, I, I struggled. There were no way to add, no ways to advertise. I didn't really quite have the genre stuff down. And I, I had just written like most people do starting out sort of the story I wanted to tell without worrying about like, is this written to market? What are the categories on Amazon? I never looked at the categories on Amazon before I started writing the book. Um, but I think that the characters were strong enough in that first book and the story was appealing enough. I mean, I know this is true that I, every time I did get somebody to read it, you know, some of those people became fans, became super fans and were there to buy the later books in the series as it progressed. 
So it's, you know, I hate to say, don't just publish your first book, but you probably should not publish your first book. You should, or if you do, if you can, going to do that one, do like Andrea did. <laughs> Maybe you have to do, get feedback and do six different versions of it. I mean, I actually, the characters in my first book are the same characters I used in the earlier books. I just, I took people's feedback and, and changed things, changed who was driving the action, added a female character, which is like, she's the main complete character that the story revolves around in that first series now. And she didn't exist in the first novel that I did with some of those characters. So yeah, you, you know, just because you don't publish your first book doesn't mean like you can't use the idea or like I said, maybe you're just severely editing it based on feedback, but it is good to get that critical feedback before you publish it. Really, you know, and try to, uh, we've talked about before how writers tend to either have way too much confidence. They think their first book is amazing and becoming a bestseller because how could it not be? You've written, read so many books and yours are so much better than them. So that's one extreme. And then the other extreme is we don't have any confidence at all. And we're really scared to put that first book out. And I, I'm, I was always more in, into that side, but I had a little bit of confidence in the characters and, and that sort of stuff just because I'd sold a few things. So whatever it takes for you, I, like I said, I, probably wouldn't recommend publishing the first book. That is just me. Joe, do you have any last thoughts on this before we wrap up after an hour and a half of babbling? Sure. Um, people who don't write tend to think that the hardest part about writing a book is coming up with the idea. And uh, the hardest part about writing a book is writing the book. In fact, the, I dare say the hardest part about writing a book is finishing a book. Um, and like my mom was a tremendous, she came with fantastic ideas and she had tremendous premises and she tried writing, but she had a terrible tendency to just, well, you know, people will connect the dots. I don't have to put everything in there. And, and, uh, there mom had a premise, which I might still do because it was good enough. But, but when I read her first treatment on it, it felt like she had written three successive endings. Like she just had difficulty, uh, uh actually crafting it into something which was cogent. So, uh, yeah, like you definitely not like you need to be good at every part of writing, at least or at least capable at every part of writing. And if you find that you you, you don't find out that you are going to do it bad until you've done it wrong at least once. And then you need to assess and improve. And again, if that means that your first book is not publishable, then you're going to have to write a second book. All right. On that note, we are done. Remember when I was like, hey, guys, should we make this two episodes? And nobody said anything. So I just left it all in there. I'm like, let's cover this all today. Hopefully you guys appreciated the show. Let us know if you listen to the end. We, we like to hear that. And uh, thank you again for listening. And thank you to Joshua Pearson for producing the show. You can find the show notes or leave a comment or question at sixfigureauthors.com with the number six. And of course, we are in the Facebook group. Uh, six Figure Authors on Facebook. Thanks, everyone. Have a great new year. See y'all later. So long, everybody. <laughs>